All right, so this video is um, making up for the fact that I forgot we had class. <laughs> and the class was about Sophia. And um, so I'm going to talk about what I, the highlights, what I think of as the highlights. And um, then you can just look at that and write your reactions in your post. You've already written your reactions to the reading. So you can write reactions to my presentation and then your final takeaway. And then the papers are due on for Lion the 19th and for Bangladesh the 20th. I think that's right. And I would, I require you to come to conferences with an outline. So you already have your idea. You can't come and say, I don't know, tell me what to do. Tell your, you know, decide which goddess uh, is, seems the most natural and how you've had to, already had to adjust in order to fit in with what you needed or wanted. Um, you should also think a lot about to what extent do I allow other people to tell me who I am or force me into a way of life I don't want? And to what extent do I become my own agent, right? Do I start creating my own life? And that's what some of the quotes are about. Um, and I really, it's an open question. Um, there are a couple, two things I want you to know before I start. First of all, wherever you end up in life, if you end up, you know, in the middle of a very traditional uh, family life and you, you know, you finished your education, maybe you don't even have a job and you're playing the role of the wife and mother don't think that I would think less of you because I did that, okay, for five years. I did that. I got kicked out of graduate school. I just said, heck with it. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I'm going to enjoy my children for five years. Um, so there's really nothing that I would uh, prefer for you there's two things you have to keep in mind, that life is long, which I've said before, and that there's plenty ahead. Um, I am going to actually show a video of women who are 50 over 50. There's a series going on about women over 50 whose lives just took off after they were 50. And this started out with an American, US women. And now they're gonna start one for European women and they're gonna start one for Asian women. So in your lifetime, there are way more poems, histories, essays, uh, literary works, artworks by Asian women than there ever were for me about any women <laughs> growing up. So you're way ahead of the game in terms of uh, being ahead of Dr. Beck at your age. Um, again, you might, that might surprise you, I don't know, but really you're way ahead, you're much more aware. I did not become aware of patriarchy until I was 35. And by then I had three kids and no job. And it was just, I had dug a huge hole for myself. So um, whatever happens, don't ever think that I think any less of you. I'm always supporting you no matter where your life is. I want you to think of me as somebody who supports women and you can enjoy whatever roles you want to play. I've told you that before, but I thought I'd just wrap it up now that we're at the end. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, okay. So I support you and don't ever stop creating your life.
So the first chapter, the conclusion on the love story is going to be, I'm going to focus on these old emotions, these crippled patriarchal emotions that women that will trigger inside of a woman. And you, and you, know, you might recognize, gosh, I'm feeling this. I don't want to feel this. Um, because you've been wired to feel this way. So first of all, we flush out all of that. And then the second half, I'll read you some essays that just keep focusing on the need to be creative and to constantly create and recreate your life. So the first one is um, where Boland says at the end of her book, competition, conflicts, and alliances among the goddesses occur within a woman's psyche, um, as they once did on Mount Olympus. There's no one and for all answer. There's a continual dialogue between all the goddesses. This, I experienced this horrible, right? This constant dialogue between wanting to be the good mom, wanting to be the good wife, wanting to be the good teacher, wanting to be the good scholar, wanting, oh my gosh, it was really internally conflicted. So the thing you need to do is when you get at a point in life where there's a lot of goddesses at work, try to just sort them out, not let yourself be destroyed by it, not, not think that you're not good enough. So what happened to me is that I was juggling all these things and other women were not. So that everything I did, I didn't do well enough, okay? So if I volunteered at my kid's school, it was not very much. If I volunteered at church, well, I didn't do very much. If I, if I taught my classes well, I was just an adjunct. And I didn't fish, finish my dissertation early enough, so I got kicked out. If I was trying to be uh, you know, a good mom, well, you're not an at-home mom. That was kind of the standard. So it's just, I was doing more than anybody who criticized me for not doing enough because they weren't doing all the things I was doing. But everywhere I went, you know, there was always this message, you're not good enough. So please don't internalize that. And don't think that, you know, the professors you have haven't had some of those experiences. They don't talk about it, which is, I think, unfortunate. Just the idea is that I have, I will have empathy with you no matter what happens. Um, so let's see, in my mind, this is me writing, Sophia speaks to each of the goddesses, telling them what they should and should, should not do so that mortals will be able to love them without ruining themselves, right, without obsessing. She acknowledged the value of each goddess and then admonishes her not to overstep her own boundaries and drive a mortal person mad. They, she insists the goddesses remember that mortals have to live within their natural limits. They have to create a culture that does not destroy the natural world, and they have to work together to avoid destroying each other. Okay, so Hera, she says, I respect your great virtue of connecting sexuality to a lifelong commitment to one person. Um, when a mortal is possessed by you, she's given the blessing of making this commitment. Um, and that's really important. And Harris, but Sophia warns, you know, you have to convince your husband that his philanthropy should be dedicated to promoting a sustainable society because these goddesses are trying to work together to create a sustainable society. So Hera has got to tell her husband to change his business, right? To make it sustainable. Okay, and Hera says, okay, but Aphrodite has to stop shooting her arrows and making my husband unfaithful. Athena has to stop telling me that, um, 
that I don't care enough about politics. Artemis has to stop um, telling me that I care about marriage rather than the wilderness. Demeter has to stop picking on me because I don't spend as much time with my kids as she would prefer. And Hestia has to, has to stop telling me I should think more. I'm not a thinker. I don't care about thinking. This is who I am. And it's I will support my, I understand my place is to get my husband to change the, his use of power so that we can move toward a sustainable future. Okay, Demeter, Demeter. Um, you're to be highly honored among the goddesses because you recognize the vulnerability of babies and young children, and you plant the seed of, seed of nurturing that every mother has to have to raise her child to adulthood. But Demeter, when you obsess about children, you prevent, it can prevent you from making them accountable to live sustainably right? You spoil them, you give them too much stuff, or you protect them too much so they can't function in the adult world. Um, so you have to help your babies grow up and not want to always live in an innocent world, and you want to hold them accountable, teach them to be accountable to the rest of the society and to the natural world. And Demeter says, okay, but Aphrodite has to stop shooting her arrows because it undermines my family and my children. Hera has to spend more time with the kids rather than her husband. Athena has to stop, you know, keep telling me I should worry about politics. I worry about kids. Artemis should stop um, telling my children they should be more aggressive. They don't, you know, there's too much aggression in this world. I think they should be more nurturing. And Hestia, I don't care about thinking, Hestia. I care about doing, about little kids. You can't sit around and think if you care about little kids. Okay, Anita, you've had your say. Fine, we have to respect her. Everybody agree. When kids are little, they're vulnerable. Demeter steps in. Okay, Artemis, um, Artemis, um, you would, okay. So you're very important for giving people drive. You also give people a perspective from outside of human culture. You speak for the natural world. You give people a spirit of loving the outdoors and feeling the connection between their own natural self and the natural world. So that should be a real driver in getting people to live sustainable. sustainable. But Artemis, your aggression can get out of control. You can get so angry at people and so impatient. You don't understand that most people cultivate relationships and relationships are nurtured through listening, taking time, avoiding aggression. People don't just live for causes. They usually live to love and be loved. And you have to remember that. Or nobody's going to care about saving the wilderness. They'll just be mad at you. <laughs> okay, Artemis. And then Artemis says, okay, but I get frustrated with Hera because she doesn't make these demands on her husband. I get frustrated with Demeter because she spoils the kids and lets them eat junk food and litter and you know have a high fossil fuel childhood, which is completely unnecessary. I get frustrated with Aphrodite that prevents people from getting focused on environmental protection because they're all having sex with each other. And, and also Aphrodite, all this fossil fuel um, heavy products that get women to obsess about their bodies, um, liposuction and breast implants and skin whitening lotion, all this crap just makes the situation worse. 
I get frustrated with Athena when she gets so obsessed about politics and just succeeding politically that she lets political leaders ignore the need for sustainability. And I get obsessed with Hesia because I don't need to sit and think. I got to save the wilderness. Okay, everybody understand Artemis has her claims. She's going to agree not to be so aggressive, not to be so angry. And you guys have to respect her. Okay. Athena. Okay, Athena, you're the great strategist. You could really help us get through the patriarchy. We need a goddess who's savvy about those men, who can talk to them in ways that will convince them, who can strategize in ways that will get them to restructure our economic and political systems so that we become sustainable. So we depend on you. But, Sophia warns, Athena, sometimes you side with the men sometimes at the expense of women and at the expense of the environment. It's like all you really care about is getting the approval of these guys and then gaining power by approving of them rather than being critical of the system that we have. So Athena says, okay, I know it looks like all I do is kiss up to men, but in order to be effective, I have to agree, agree with men when they're doing the best in the situation. Because sometimes they don't have a lot of good choices. Um, sometimes they have to ignore women and women's concern in order to uh, sign a peace treaty or, or do something else, which, which uh, sometimes they have to declare war because the situation is so bad. So, you know, I can't do everything and I can't, uh, I do have to fit in with the political situation. I get really annoyed with Artemis uh, because she's too much of a man hater and she has no patience. I get really tired of Aphrodite who keeps shooting her arrows in the men and they get distracted and they can't govern, and their families all want power, even when they're completely incapable of it. They keep having these children with different wives, and the kids fight over the power and the money. It's just awful. <laughs> I get mad at Hestia because I don't want to think that much. I want to do stuff. Um, I get mad at Hera because she doesn't hold her husband accountable um, and she doesn't really care if he if he is just he's just her husband and she likes being identified with power and I get mad at Demeter when she all she cares about her are her kids and she her kids can violate the law or really not care about citizenship and she'll love them all she doesn't expect them to worry about being a good citizen. What am I supposed to do? And then Persephone acts too much like a victim. It's like, I understand victimization, but you got to get over it and move forward. So Sophia says, okay, girls, <laughs> you got to get this. Here's, here's what Athena can do, and the rest of you have to behave. Okay. To Hestia, Sophia says, our long conversations have given me the ability to explain to the goddesses what each has to offer and how each can go too far. Without you, we would not be able to articulate a foundation from which to have a meaningful conversation. We would just sit around this table griping at each other, each goddess obsessing about how the others cut her off. But we get annoyed when you get so absorbed in your thoughts that you can't really communicate and you can't really be effective. You can't be thinking all the time. You got to come out and uh, do things and assert things and demand things and change things. Um, okay, Sophia. Yes, it is a flaw. I would rather just agree with myself 
and sit at home. But honestly, the other goddesses don't seem to want to try and understand difficult concepts or ideas that would require them to live more examined lives. They just want to keep justifying themselves. Athena cares about um, justice. Uh, Persephone cares about victims. Demeter cares about babies. Artemis cares about causes, environmental um, self sustainability. Hera cares about her husband. And um, every Aphrodite doesn't care about anything but pleasure. And it's just annoying, right? That they're obsessed and they won't listen to me um, and they won't balance things out. And so Sophia says, okay, guys, everybody understand? This is what Hestiatra has to offer. You need to listen to her. Okay, Persephone. To Persephone, Sophia says, you continually remind men and women of how sexual aggression in men does great physical and psychological damage to women. Men can think they're flattering women by being sexually attracted to them when they're really terrorizing them or demeaning them treating them like the objects of pleasure rather than like human beings. You expose the ugly darkness in men and make women aware of how vulnerable they are. You try to heal the victims, um, hiding them away from further vulnerability. But Persephone, you have to tell women, you have to admit that some women provoke men and try to manipulate their sexual response. You have to tell women that they don't always have to be victimized and they're not always the victims. Men and women play sexual games. You should make clear to them that they should become more reflective about how they act. Um, and then you help them get over their trauma and move forward. Okay, so Persephone says, um, I get tired of Artemis who just wants to deny the trauma and the victimization that you have to go through the process of healing. And she just keeps saying, suck it up, suck it up. It's like, no, it takes time for the psyche to heal. Athena um, doesn't understand victimization. She just wants people to um, act justly. So she doesn't understand enough. She doesn't insist on there being enough laws to prevent this on enforcement of the law. Um, and she doesn't understand at all if an abused woman, woman will go and kill her husband, right? Or fight back and undermine the justice system. Um, Cause she doesn't understand victimization. I get angry at Aphrodite for making rape glamorous, right? That's really annoying. I get angry at Hera for denying that her husband is um, engaged in this kind of sexual conquest. She just takes it of, as an offense and goes after the woman <laughs> instead of just acknowledging that her husband is a beast, right? He's, he's uh, harming other women. Um, I wish Demeter would not focus so obsessively on children, um, especially, um, yeah, children who are born into dysfunctional families. She only focuses on the children. She needs to recognize that the mothers are traumatized also, and the mothers can't help their kids unless they heal. Um, Okay, so, okay, Persephone, we all have to recognize that there is a real violence there and that that prevents the rest of you from getting your, your goals met, but you can't just tell Persephone that women should suck it up or something else. You have to let them heal. Okay, Aphrodite, all right, Aphrodite. Um, we all recognize you for who you are. We don't need to, you don't need to draw attention to yourself. 
Um, without you, the other goddesses get no pleasure in doing their tasks. Um, they might obsess about it, but they don't take pleasure in it and they don't enjoy life. And everybody should enjoy life. And um, who wants to be serious if you can't take some pleasure in it and enjoy sensuality, just enjoy being alive. Um, but Aphrodite, you've perverted the experience of pleasure by uh, reducing it to sexual gratification, especially male sexual gratification. The love of beauty shouldn't primarily be connected to sex. Um, if you would grow up, Aphrodite, men and women would recognize spiritual beauty. If you would bestow your blessing on those who love sacred passions, they would grow old gracefully and beautifully and not worry about their bodies. Okay, Aphrodite says, I know the power I have. It's so easy to get men to respond to me. I always think the other goddesses are jealous and they would do what I do if they could. But I know you get frustrated with me, Sophia. First to Hera. Hera, you married your, your man because you wanted to be the wife of a powerful man. And so he feels used sometimes. You always go to the dinner parties and you are the, the wife. And you know, like, it's as if he got used and you're, you're, you're not pleasant to be with. You don't, um, you don't just meet my men's needs, their emotional needs, because you're too much playing a role. So um, then when a man does seek out some woman who will um, just relax with him, just let him be himself, then she goes, you're so vindictive toward those women. Um, you know, you, anyway, so you need to understand that these men are not, they have needs that are unmet, that are not just sexual gratification. Um, you can't treat your husband like an object and then complain if he treats, if he tries to find another wife to satisfy him. Um, Artemis, you, you disrespect um, men too much because of the harm they do. So you've become a man hater. And that's, Aphrodite says, you can't hate men. That's too much. It's going too far. Um, okay. How can, okay, since Aphrodite, you've rejected civilization altogether. So how can you expect to be accepted, right? How, you know, how can you say everything I stand for is rotten and then I'm supposed to follow you and dedicate my life to sustainability, right? Um, Athena, you only see men from the public point of view, you know, when they're in the offices running the world but you don't realize they have emotional needs too. And um, gratifying them is not just a distraction from their roles as leaders. It's a part of life to Demeter. It's just Demeter, you get so obsessed about your babies that you don't realize that men need to get your attention and they need to develop a relationship with you, not just you know, being the one who is the provider for the babies, you and the babies. Um, Persephone, I know some men are violent. Uh, sexual violence is not my thing. I drive men to fall in love with women. The violence is their choice. I seek pleasure. Violence is the opposite of pleasure. So don't blame me for the violence. Uh, Hestia, um, let's see, uh, your world of thought doesn't mean anything to me, right? Why should I have to pay attention to that? Because I know how much control I have over human beings and over human history. 
Um, the other goddesses need to heed me and take joy in what they do and have a sense of humor about life. They need to experience the ecstasy of just being alive, right? Okay, Aphrodite. Um, I understand we all have, we are sensuous creatures too, and we have to enjoy our senses, but you have a lot more power than the rest of the goddesses because you are that energy, right? That original trigger. So please try to contain yourself um, because if we, when we obsess too much about physical things, we truly destroy the natural world. It's a, it's a major cause. It's just a lack of sustainability. It's this desire for physical gratification and for material consumption and for being uh, judged according to the beauty of the material objects we have, the beauty of our bodies, a very superficial idea of beauty. So please, Aphrodite, lay up. Okay, so that's the story of the old passions, the passions that have been planted in patriarchy, the emotions that women feel because they've been molded by male domination in their society. So the next part are women who are writing and trying to envision uh, a new way of organizing society. And so I'll read a few quotes from that. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, here's one thing. When I was your age, I really thought there would be a lot more movies, books, plays, poems, a lot more art that would have a woman protagonist, right? The woman is the main character and she goes through all the spiritual quest. She's the one who's coming of age. She's the one who's powerful, you know, works her way, just the way it's usually men. So I definitely thought by, by the time I was my age, it'd be like 50-50, but it's not at all. Like the Hollywood is one of the most sexist industries. The percentage of women who are directors or producers, the ones who can actually govern how the actresses and actors behave and let women be more assertive because the vast majority of male directors are still putting women in these traditional roles. It's really hard to find something. Um, so the Carolyn uh, Heilbrunn is, you know, she was writing a while ago, a few decades ago. And she said, uh, even women can learn to identify with the protagonist. And I remember when I was young, there were a lot of male protagonists that I identified with, but, and there were very few female, the ones I remember, I don't know if any of you know the book, Little Women, um, Joe, there's some movies about her and um, Jane Austen, but not much. I, it was pretty old before I, I was like in college before I was introduced to Jane Austen. So, the ones when I was younger tended to be male. Um, then in the War and Peace, I identified with Pierre. He was the serious one. So it was almost always a man if there was a serious character in any play or book. So fortunately, my parents treated me as an equal, and so I easily identified with them. But but still, it's totally different. When I actually started living my life and trying to juggle family with my career, with the way I think, I realized nobody, every, every philosopher I've read, none of them have ever spent any time taking care of children. And like, I can't, I don't have a life like any of these people that I read and that I teach. And that I used to love. I just don't love them anymore. They don't know anything about life. 
But that's horrible because you need role models and you need books and you need movies and you need, that's why I started reading books by for and about women obsessively. And fortunately, again, you have, you have a lot more access to a lot more materials. And I would encourage you to keep looking for women protagonists in a movie or those, there's plenty of interviews of, of, you know, women in various roles, women as leaders in various ways. I think, again, with Demeter and Hera, you have Melinda Gates is uh, Hera, but she's very much promoting women's well-being. You could have easily a Demeter type who's, who is really working on education because she really cares about kids, but she's also becoming a leader. So I think there's there must be a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, let's see. The other, um, okay, here's something else I wanted to read to you. And it's about teaching. It's on the sixth page. I don't know if you read all that, but here it is. It's I taught like this before I read this book, but when I read this book, I thought, okay, that's right. The kind of teacher, so this book is about interviewing women and asking them what, what kind of teacher they liked, especially women who'd gotten away from college and went back to college. The kind of teacher the women praised and the kind for which they yearned was one who would help them articulate and expand their knowledge. A midwife teacher. Midwife teachers are the opposite of banker teachers. While the bankers deposit knowledge in the learner's head, the midwives draw it out. They assist the students in giving birth to their own ideas, in making their own tacit knowledge explicit and elaborating it. The midwife teacher's first concern is to preserve the student's fragile newborn thoughts, to see that they are born with their truth intact, that they do not turn into acceptable lies. The second concern in maternal thinking is to foster the children's, uh, children, students' growth. Connected teachers support the evolution of their students' thinking. Midlife teachers encourage students to use their knowledge in everyday life. Okay, so a connected teacher is, is not just another student. The role carries special responsibilities. It does not entail power over the students. However, it does carry authority, an authority based not on subordination, but on cooperation. Connected teachers are believers. They trust their students' thinking and encourage them to expand it. Um, let's see. Women have argued in this book that educators can help women develop their own authentic voices if they emphasize connection over separation, understanding and acceptance over assessment and collaboration over debate. If they accord respect to and allow time for the knowledge that emerges from firsthand experience, instead of imposing their own expectations and arbitrary requirements, they, it, they encourage students to evolve their own patterns of work based on the problems they're pursuing. These are the lessons we've learned in listening to women's voices. And so, in my case, you know, not only do I do this as a matter of the kind of teacher, but I mean, I admire my students' characters way more than I admire my own. <laughs> I think my students are stronger people already than I ever was, especially than I was when I was 20. Um, so, They've, you know, you, you've all overcome a lot more obstacles than I have, even at your age. So I truly 
like you to draw your own voice because you, there's been some voice inside of your head that has enabled you to get to where you are. And you just have to find that voice and keep it alive as you go through a lot more stuff in life. Um, so I admire you and I learn a lot from you and I'm humbled by you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, uh, it just takes my breath away how so many of my students are doing such great things. Um, so that goes way beyond just sort of being a midwife teacher and principal. Uh, it's just like, I want to know this stuff. I want to know what these young women are doing. Okay, so here's another thing about the female brain, right? And this is a big issue for me. Um, the reason why I forgot is that I'm going to give a presentation next Saturday and I was working on it and I was really, really worried, I'm incredibly anxious because I think about Plato in a way that's more connected and, and my brain is more connected, but it's been read by men, for men, about men. And I, it has nothing to do with Plato. And it's, but it's just for the first time in my life, which is I'm retired, you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to say what I think. And it's going to be radically different. It's just going to drop a bomb in the middle of all of the other scholars and the way they live. They just sit there and obsess about words. It drives me nuts. So that was why I got had forgotten about the class is that I'm in the middle of this situation where I'm in a very patriarchal discipline and they keep reading Plato through categories that are enlightenment or just something not at all to do with Plato. So I just try to understand Plato within his culture and everything is connected to everything. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it is really good. It is a cause of anxiety because I just have gotten chewed out so often in the profession that I really am phobic about it. But anyway, that was why. And this says, um, even though there are now proven scientific differences between men's and women's brains, in many ways, this is a goal golden age for women. In the age of Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, it was the first time in Western history that men gained enough resources to have the leisure for intellectual and scientific pursuits. The 21st century is the first time in history that women are in a similar position. These options give women the gift of using their female brains to create a new paradigm for the way they manage their professional, reproductive, and personal lives. So I am going to present a new paradigm for how to read Plato. And I think I'm going to get completely chewed out for it. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can ask me what well, that's next Saturday. So um, yeah, that'll be the next time we have class. You can say, well, Dr. Beck, how did it go? It's like, oh. <laughs> But at least my students will kind of understand. Um, okay, so here's another quote from Jill Kirkconway. I knew from observing the people I most admired who were a generation or so older than I that an adult life can be made a work of art. It's a slowly emerging design. And so the, the point here I'm making is don't ever stop creating your life. Um, it will, there will be many, many different chapters to it. Weaving together, oh, and especially when it comes to environmentalism, weaving together the many strands of the eco-feminist movement is the concept of reproduction construed in its broadest sense to include the continuance of life on earth. That's what I mean by the goddess. The, all the goddesses are emanations from the great goddess, right? She didn't think of that. She hadn't read about this stuff yet. 
because this is pretty recent, um, in terms of scholars becoming aware, digging it up and thinking it's valuable. It's not recent at all, like 35,000 years ago, but it's been silent until recently. So in this sense, um, in the sense of uh, thinking of reproduction in its broadest sense, there's perhaps more unity than diversity in women's common goal of restoring the natural environment and the quality of life for people and other living and non-living things on the planet. So that I, I think, I hope you can understand that um, that's another major theme in the goddesses is that they should weave together in terms of creating a sustainable world. Um, there's a habit of mind uh, that grows from experiencing one's own limits and potential that may lead towards societal solution, solutions to sustainability, right? Um, the fundamental problem of our society and our species is to discover a way to flourish that will not be at the expense of some other community or of the biosphere to replace competition with creative interdependence. At the present, we're steadily depleting the planet of resources and biological diversity. The developed world thrives on the poverty of the self. We are in need of an understanding of global relationships that will be not only sustainable, but also enriching. It must come to us as a positive challenge, a vision worth fulfilling. Okay, so that's, um, we have to re-envision things. And I think, I, the, the thing about re-envisioning for um, environmentalism is that it includes every goddess, even the most traditional like Demeter, setting up an educational system where children learn from when they're young to care about sustainability. And then, yeah, it doesn't really leave women out in any of the roles that they play. So that's, I mean, it's difficult for someone like Hera to get her husband's company or whatever power he exercises to be more sustainable. But in her role as the wife of the president or whatever, she could bring that in, right? She could say, like, my husband wants the company to be more this way. He has to be, com to be competitive in the market. He has to be more fossil fuel heavy than he wants to be. So let's just come together as a community and find ways. If you buy enough, if together collectively, people start purchasing low, fossil fuel products or uh, carbon free products, the price of the products will go down and you can start to have sustainability. Now, again, it's not the responsibility of the developing countries. It's really the developed countries that have to consume carbon free uh, products enough so that the price goes down. So I understand that. And again, but we really need to not pit women against each other. Even on that, that's the biggest problem. That's what the reading for um, the next time is about global feminism and how this conflict between privileged women um, who keep telling to women in developing countries what they should care about, what they shouldn't care about, which is really bad. Um, and so we will talk about that. And also I want you to bring your own examples and you will have great examples talking about me wanting to listen to you. So I want you to do your assignment of bringing examples because I wanna learn about the things that you know about, right? You know this from experience or you should learn about the stuff that I ask you to look up. So I think it's, we all benefit. We both benefit, right? Everyone benefits from learning about the things that you do research on or the things that you just draw from personal experience. So 
I also think it becomes obvious when you talk about the goddesses that we are all so much more alike than different. Um, but there are ways that patriarchy will try to divide us. Um, and we just shouldn't let that happen. So this is um, this is the the class. I, I don't know how long this class has been. But anyway, you can write your comments and we can start the next class with your comments on what you read and then what I just said. Okay, thank you. Sorry again about forgetting. At least you know why. <laughs>